Uh, Bishop, you'll be glad to know that Charles Wesley, who wrote that, is my favorite hymn writer, and he was born 250 years to the day before I was. Uh, so I, December 18th, 1707. Karen uh, asked me to just say a few words about my personal uh, testimony, which she has heard uh, previously. Uh, uh, my dad loved the orphan, and I'm here because of him. Uh, I never met my uh, biological uh, mother, but I'm forever grateful for her uh, that she gave me life. Uh, 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 you know, I w wished I could find her. Thank her. Can't do that. Um, <clears throat> uh, Lynn knows I'm just a big crybaby. Uh, let me uh, get my pull myself together here. Uh, but I wish I had been able to meet meet her at some point in my life and d just tell her thank you for choosing to give me life. Um, I'm the uh, uh, I'm the youngest of five children that I know about, and uh, and uh, my. Uh, 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 my uh, biological mother had had an affair, and uh, uh, she just she was poor, uh, single, four other children. She just didn't feel like she could keep a child. When she found she was uh, uh, pregnant, she went to another part of the state where she could have um, me and then put me um, up for adoption without any pressure to keep, keep me. And uh, so um, I, I went into the foster care system and then to an orphanage in the state of uh, Ar Arkansas. And, uh, uh, the, uh, and I know that if my father uh, had not taken uh, me into his home, uh, then uh, I would have grown up um, in poverty, uh, poorly educated, uh, there, uh, you know, that would have been uh, my my life. I know enough about my biological family to know that that's um, the the case. Uh, but my father was an orphanage director and a Presbyterian minister, and uh, they uh, took me into the home. And uh, uh, when, just before my second birthday, uh, uh, my adoption was finalized, and that that means so so much uh, to me that my dad loved the orphan. He uh, gave me. Uh, uh, he gave me uh, his love. He gave me a love for education, wh which I'm sure I would not have had otherwise. And um, I became a minister. Uh, there was I've never had a vocational crisis or anything like that. Never had to hunt, dis take a test, decide what I want to do with my life. My dad was a pastor. I loved what he did, and I just followed in his steps. And uh, when I teach at seminary, I tell the uh, students that, you know, uh, uh, I had a mentor pastor, it was my dad, and really all I'm doing is going on and sharing with, um, uh, with you what I learned from my uh, father. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think one of the easy, one of the reasons why being, uh, b uh, you know, a believer in the doctrines of grace, of Predesti believing in predestination uh, is because I am well aware that the most important decision by far that was ever made uh, uh, with regard to me was made not by me, but by someone else. And I tell people regularly uh, the, so, uh, the most important decisions that are made in our lives are those that are made not by us, but for us. And the defining moment of my life from a human perspective is when my uh, father uh, uh, and mother uh, decided to adopt me uh, into their, their family. And it made me, it was very easy for me to grasp uh, the wonder of a God who, from before the foundation of the world, decided to adopt me in his, into his family. Well, that's my um, testimony, and I don't share it very, very often for obvious reasons, and, uh, but um, uh, thank you for asking me, me, me to do that. I tried to pull off what my dad would have done. My dad, whenever he talked about something with regard to his own life, anything that was personal from the pulpit, 
he talked about it in the third person. And so the only persons in the, in the sanctuary that knew who he was talking about was his family. Uh, but I, I couldn't share that in the third person, I don't think. Okay, uh, uh, let's get uh, to uh, uh, the reason he asked me to come. Uh, let, uh, let's uh, look at Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 31 through 39. And what's going to sustain you uh, in your suffering? Well, it's knowing that you're secure in God's love. It's knowing that there is nothing, nothing that can separate you uh, from the love of God. Uh, before I read uh, uh, God's word, let's go to him in prayer. We come before you, Father, thanking you for your great love for us. Your children, you nourish us from your word. Uh, give us minds that understand, affections that delight in the truths of your word, uh, that delight in receiving the Lord Jesus Christ who's offered in the gospel as our Savior, as our sanctifier, as our sustainer. And we would pray that you would strengthen our wills, that knowing the truth of the gospel the life it calls us to, we might uh, joyfully submit ourselves to your fatherly care. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, hear God's word, Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And here ends the scripture lesson, and this is the word of God. <clears throat> uh, pain uh, comes like uh, flood waters to a home. Uh, pain finds its way into every crack and makes it wider and makes it deeper. Pain finds every crack in your character. Uh, impatience, anger, bitterness, you name it. It worsens the flaw and it weakens our resolve. And unless our trust in God's sovereign kingship and fatherly love, you've got to trust in both of them, his sovereign kingship and fatherly love is more intense than our pain we will find ourselves angry and hating the very people we worship uh, and work with. And I don't want to see that happen uh, to anyone in this room. Uh, this afternoon, we reached verse 31, and let me very quickly review how we got here. Uh, there's God's sovereignty. Look at verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, we discovered this morning, uh, uh, when we asked the question, what are the all things in which God works for my good? Well, it means all things. Absolutely everything that you experience in life. Uh, verse 35 tells us that. You'll notice that there are seven different types of suffering there. It's meant to be all-encompassing. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. Representative list, you just take whatever hardship you bring to this place 
uh, this afternoon, insert it, and God is working in that uh, for your good. Uh, then there's God's sovereign plan. We asked this morning, what is the good God works for? Well, it's found in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed uh, to the image of his Son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. Uh, we understand that the good that God is working for is our Christ-likeness, for our character to be conformed to his character. This is what God is doing in your life 24 by 7. So let's clarify a final time. The good is not, first of all, your happiness, but your holiness. The good is not your comfort, but your character. And the good uh, focuses the spotlight upon not your desires, but upon your duty. Then we saw that there's the execution of God's sovereign plan. We'll look at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Uh, and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Uh, uh, there's your security. We found that this morning. God foreknew you, not facts about you. He foreknew you. He foreloved you. He predestined you. He chose you from before the foundations of the world to be his child. He chose to save you from your sins. He chose to bring you uh, to everlasting glory. Uh, the, the, the decision made in the councils of eternity, that's what Paul is talking about here. And as we saw this morning, if you take this to heart, and I'm hoping that you do, if you take this to heart, it means that the God who has loved you from eternity past and who will love you to eternity for future loves you right now in the midst of whatever affliction you are facing. He called you. That's the effective call that creates what it commands. His call overcame every reason you could manufacture not to believe in Jesus. He overcame them all, and with that call, he gave faith and repentance. He justified you, declared you right with him, and he uh, will glorify you. And as we saw this morning, so certain is your future glorification that he can talk about it now as a present possession. Well, that brings us to verse 31. And so let me ask this afternoon, uh, just how secure are you in God's love? That's the burden of my message this afternoon. I want you to be secure in God's love. And so I'm asking you, just how secure are you in God's love? Well, Pastor Paul uh, shows us in three truths uh, just how secure we are in his love. Let's look at those truths. Truth number one, your enemies cannot separate you from God and his love. Your enemies cannot, cannot separate you from God and his love. Think about uh, your enemies. And I know everyone in this room has enemies. That enemy who would harm you, that disease that would kill you, that once close friend who betrayed you. No enemy is stronger than God. No enemy is as powerful a as God. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Do you feel that the whole world is against you? Well, there's good news here. God is greater than the world. And if God is for you, who can be against you? And what we want to communicate, uh, you out in your Rafiki villages, me and my congregation, we want to communicate to those we live and serve with, those dear believers that have been entrusted to our care, we want to communicate to them that we are for them in Jesus Christ. We're not there to scold them. We're not uh, there to uh, 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 harass them because they don't 
reach the standards we want them to reach. No, we're there for them in Jesus Christ. And the good things that are going to come into their life, it's going to come to them as they know the fullness of God's love for them in Christ the Savior. We want them to know that God is for sinners in Christ uh, Jesus. We are for men and women in Jesus Christ. One of, one of our sons served in the Marine Corps, and uh, uh, during the uh, invasion in Iraq, uh, we didn't have a television set at the time. We ended up getting one uh, uh, so we could watch the news. And, you know, you're thinking, well, maybe when they're doing these interviews, uh, uh, you're going to see your son in the background. Uh, of course, that, that, that never happened. But one of the more interesting interviews that I saw was uh, this embedded reporter, reporter from one of the major news uh, sources uh, that uh, traveled with the Marines. And he had on his camouflage, and he was uh, saying, you know, I eat with the Marines, I sleep with the Marines, I, uh, I go wherever the Marines go, and over a period of weeks, I began to think, I'm a Marine. And uh, then he uh, said uh, that when they were moving into a, 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 a city and gunfire broke out, he did the reasonable thing. He fell flat on his face. And then he uh, looked up and said he saw the whole line of Marines in front of him turning toward the gunfire and moving toward it. Uh, and he said it was then that I realized that I was not a Marine. <laughs> well, I've thought about that picture. Those Marines were turning in unison uh, to move toward an enemy to destroy them. And I, I, th I thought that's a picture of terrifying power. But it would be a picture of beautiful Christian blessing if, if we as a church, as missionary teams, when we heard the cries of one suffering, we turned as a unit toward them and moved uh, to bring to them the blessings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, if God is for us, uh, then we must be for our fellow believers. We must be for our world. That means we have to be careful about how we talk about uh, people. Uh, I, I'm, uh, as, uh, I'm, I am ecstatic about the overturning of Roe versus Wade. I, it, 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 it's just uh, uh, one of the, uh, it's something that's been needed in our country for so long. I'm hoping that it's going to turn out to be an awakening in America, a renewed appreciation for life. I'm hoping all those good things are going to occur. But we have to understand that when uh, someone is holding those positions that we find wrong, even evil, uh, we are not fighting against them. We're fighting against the evil one, and we have to move toward them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we have to move toward them in love. We can't be out scolding the world. We can't be talking about the world as if they're subhuman. We've got to be moving toward the world and declaring to them that God is for sinners in Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you feel the whole world is against you? Well, God is greater than the world, and if God is for you, who can be against us? Just how great is the Father's love for you? How powerful is this Father who defeats your enemies? Look at verse 32. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Now will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Let that verse sink in. Look again at verse 32. He did not spare his own son. Octavius Winslow asks, who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money. Not Pilate for fear. Not the Jews for envy. But the Father for love. He did not spare his own son that you and me might have the blessing of salvation. Now Paul reasons from the greater, God's gift of his son, to the lesser, those gifts that come to us through him. Uh, 
He who did not spare uh, his own son, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Uh, Salvation, the forgiveness of sins, righteousness, heaven, these are what God will give you. These are his love gifts uh, to you, brothers and sisters. And I want you to be secure in his love. That's the burden of my message this afternoon. Your enemies can't separate you from God and his love. And next, your sin can't separate you from God and his love. Uh, No accuser can condemn you. That's what's found in verses 33 and 34. Look at verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. If God the judge has declared us righteous, who can overturn that verdict? No one can. Uh, There's no appeals court uh, uh, beyond uh, God on his throne. If he has declared you righteous in his sight, uh, uh, then you are righteous, and that verdict stands forever. Who can condemn us? Just look at what Christ has done for us. Again at verse 34. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Note the progression there. Crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, seated at God's right hand. The pathway of Christ's victory and the pathway uh, uh, for those for whom he died. No one can condemn you. Uh, You are secure in the Savior. Martin Luther one time said that he dreamed a dream, and in that dream, the devil opened up an enormous book. And in that book were all the sins that Martin Luther had ever committed. Every sinful thought, every evil desire, every wrongful act all of them in that book. And uh, the devil read entry after entry. And Luther said he was just crushed under the weight of listening to that account of his sins. And then he brightened and he said to the devil, ah, there's one entry that you've failed to read. What's that? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. And uh, the devil fled from him. No one can condemn you. Uh, 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 Your sin can't separate you from God and his love. God has made provision for your forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I want you to be secure in that love for you this afternoon. So I'm asking you, the burden of my message is uh, uh, for you to be secure in God's love. And I'm asking you, just how secure are you uh, this afternoon? Uh, I want you to know, it's my uh, heart's burden that you know your enemies can't separate you from God and his love. Your sin can't separate you from God and his love. And third and finally, Your dreadful circumstances can't separate you from the love of God. Look again at verses 35 uh, and 36. Uh, There we find that representative list, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Add to it cancer, intractable family problems, uh, uh, anxiety, depression. You just add whatever you're facing uh, to that list. Paul's wanting you to know that not a single one of those circumstances can shake you from the Father's hand, can separate you from the Father's uh, love. And Paul goes on and reminds the Romans that these dreadful circumstances that they find themselves in, they should be no surprise to them. They should be expected. Look at verse 36. As it is written in Psalm 44, 22, for your sake, we are, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. 
These things that are happening to your brothers and sisters, they're painful. Uh, they're, uh, they're frightening, uh, but they're occurring under God's providential care, just as he long ago forewarned. Expectations. Expectations. It's amazing how wrong-headed we can be about expectations. I used to be a scoutmaster. Uh, uh, 45 years ago, I was a scoutmaster, and I took a group of, and I hope nobody's going to get up and storm out of um, the, the building when you hear this uh, terrible thing I did, uh, but I, I took this group of kids out for a long weekend on a camping trip, and I thought it was a very pleasant weekend. I got uh, back to my uh, uh, dormitory room at college, and I, I got into bed, and uh, started to take a very long nap. And the phone rang, and I picked it up, and there on the other end of the line was an irate mother. Uh, her son had taken his, his first camping trip ever with me. And again, don't be offended, but this is what I had done. I had let her kid come home with dirty clothes. All of his clothes were, were, were dirty. And, you know, I... I uh, now I was um, I was raised to be a southern gentleman, and so I, I was I was trying to talk her off the ledge, uh, but um, all I could really think was, "Lady, what did you expect? What did you expect?" Now, now. Those, that's, that, that dear lady had misguided expectations. <laughs> but uh, far more seriously, so do many of us. So do many of us. We miss things like Psalm 44. For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. We miss verses that say things like, through many tribulations we shall enter into the kingdom of God. We miss passages that say, as Paul does to Timothy, I, I endure everything for the sake of God's elect that they might obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, we, 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 we miss uh, the, the teaching of our Lord that as they persecuted me, so will they persecute you. We, uh, we, we get our expectations wrong, and then when the inevitable comes, the trials, the adversity, the hardship, uh, we believe that God has uh, abandoned us or forgotten about us or not kept his promises to us. Uh, we, we need to rethink that. You know, one of the great uh, passages that's meant so much to me as I think about this issue is Acts uh, chapter 16. There you'll recall that uh, Paul had come to Philippi, and uh, there, among other things that he did there, he saw this uh, young lady horribly oppressed by a demon, being abused by men who were turning her into a money-making machine for them, and the Apostle Paul stepped forward, did his God-given duty, and he expelled that uh, uh, evil spirit from that girl. And she was put in her right mind, and that source of income for those evil men was gone. And what did, uh, what did uh, uh, took place next in Paul's life? Did he get a pat on the back for helping uh, someone who was suffering? taking away the source of their pain? No. Uh, he was stuck in prison and, uh, and, and, and mistreated there horribly. But what does Acts 16 tell us? Does it say that Paul and Silas were down uh, in that Philippian jail saying to each other, how could God do this? We left everything to uh, come uh, to Europe, uh, or what we call Europe, to proclaim the gospel. Uh, 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 how could he do this to us? No, we're told 
that they were praying and singing psalms. And it was out of the overflow of that joy that night uh, that that Philippian jailer came to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, We want that kind of attitude, don't we? That the God of the universe, he makes no mistakes. Uh, There are no accidents that occur under his watchful eye. Uh, Wherever he sends us, he sends us uh, to bring glory to his name and the message of salvation. And every one of you know here, you don't need me to tell you this, but people are always watching Christians, but they're never watching us more carefully than in those times when we're suffering because they want to see, do we truly believe uh, of what we profess with our lips? Are we uh, truly trusting in the God we claim is all sufficient? Your dreadful circumstances, they, they can't separate you from the love of God. Uh, not a one of them can. Just look at verse 37. Paul says, Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in life and death or death can separate us from him. Before the grave or after the grave, we'll not face any situation where we'll be separated from the love of God. Nothing in your present life or in the future can ever come between you and the Savior. Ascend the highest mountain and God's love goes with you. Descend as low as you can go. Nothing you will find there will separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, Here's the gospel truth. You're secure in God's love. Now, if you're struggling, if you're doubting, I want you to ask yourself Paul's questions. Just ask yourself the questions that Paul asks and then answer them. Verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against you? No one. Who sh- look at verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against you? God's elect. No one. Who is there to condemn you? Verse 34. No one. Verse 35. Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? No one. Now, if you're not confident in God's love for you this afternoon, uh, perhaps the reason is you're looking in the wrong direction. You're looking at your, your love for God and not his love for you. Now, listen to me carefully. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to love God. And you should want to increase that love, grow in that love, delight in that love. Uh, that's incredibly important but a far greater importance is that you know the strength of his love for you that's what we're talking about here it's a great thing to love God it's an even greater thing to know that you're loved by God love is a wondrous reality to be loved by him is immeasurably more wonderful than any love we can direct toward him So I'm always telling my uh, congregation uh, when I'm out on my pastoral visits, I want you growing in love for God. But really, when this visit comes to conclusion and I leave, what I want you to know more than anything is God's great love for you in Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to be able to affirm with all God's people in every age, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, we pray that you might grant to us afresh a knowledge of your great love for us in Jesus Christ. Uh, We open up our Bibles, and every time we do, you offer us Jesus Christ, 
He's our Savior. We've rested in him alone for salvation. He's our sanctifier. He's, he's working in us to mortify those sins uh, that, uh, that, that mar our walk with you. And we praise you for his sanctifying work. And every time we open the scriptures, we see Christ offered to us as a sustainer. And we pray that even now, as we rest upon him, trusting in him, in the midst of the various circumstances we face, uh, may we know that your love for us and him is unshakable, that there is no power in heaven and earth that can snatch us from your hand, uh, that uh, we are victorious more than conquerors in Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray that you'll answer these prayers uh, uh, to your glory, to our good, our Christ-likeness, and to the welfare of your church. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to uh, thank y'all for uh, letting me come down here and do this. Uh, 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 Karen and uh, Rose, Rosemary, I just think it's wonderful that you go to all this trouble to bring all these people here uh, just to encourage the speakers. Thank you very, very much.